Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us here today. My name is Fabiana Bakina, the executive director of the Canadian Premature Babies Foundation. For the last four months, I've been doing Facebook Live uh, with experts, healthcare professionals, clinicians, and researchers, and parents from all over Canada to talk to us about their latest research, what's happening with COVID-19, and we are bringing a lot of talks related to prematurity. And today we're gonna to talk about antenatal decision-making for extremely preterm birth with Dr. Greg Moore, who is a, a, an academic neonatologist practicing at Children's Hospital Eastern Ontario and the Ottawa Hospital. His areas of academic interest are bioethics with a focus on work with families when their baby might be born extremely preterm and postgraduate medical education. Outside his hospital life, he enjoys time with his family and cycling. Dr. Moore, thank you so much for joining us here today and taking the time away from your family and your work. Oh, my pleasure. And, and thank you so much, Fabiana, for the invitation. And I hope that uh, something I say today is useful for at least one person, if not uh, others over the coming uh, days and, and weeks that people look at these. Thank you. I really am very excited for you to share uh, your work and what your team has done to support healthcare professionals and, and expecting parents making shared personalized decisions about the initial care plan for extreme preterm birth. So are uh, you gonna take us through a presentation and then we're gonna have time for a quick Q and A at the end. Thank you, Dr. Moore. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I'll get, I'll share my screen here and uh, it's about 15 minutes of a chat uh, in, through these slides. And uh, yes, look forward to any questions if there are any. So as Fabia's, Fabiana's introduced here already, uh, this is what I'm speaking about. It's in particular, it's the decision-making before the birth of an extremely preterm infant, uh, meaning the antenatal decision and uh, my advocacy for using a shared decision-making approach uh, to involve parents in these difficult and complex decisions. So just to set the stage, when. I'm speaking about an extremely preterm infant. Today, I'm talking about babies born between 22 weeks and zero days and 25 weeks and six days. And I'm spelling that out so specifically because the actual definition is babies under 28 weeks. Uh, but as we'll look shortly as we discuss this, generally for a pregnancy that's gone reasonably well, there isn't a big decision to make in terms of what care to provide an extremely preterm infant once they're above this gestation. And so what decision am I talking about? Well, it's about really looking between two main management options, which are the first two items listed here. So palliative comfort care is where a baby would be loved and supported uh, through the provision of comfort options like holding the baby, uh, keeping them warm, perhaps putting some sucrose in their mouth. And this option for an extremely preterm infant would mean death. The baby would die generally within minutes to hours after birth. It'd be very rare for a baby to live beyond, for example, 24 hours when they're born as an extremely preterm infant if palliative comfort care was what they received. The other main option where a baby can be loved and supported is through intensive care. And that option would at a minimum involve their breathing support. So as in having a ventilator put on with a tube down their throat to help their lungs open up and to keep them alive that way, or sometimes even needing just a CPAP machine, which some of you would know about, uh, where it's usually on the nose and, and putting in uh, air to support the baby. It can also involve chest compressions uh, if CPR is needed or epinephrine as a medication to help the heart uh, pump. So those are the two main options, but I've also put two other pieces at the bottom. Um, and just to finish with intensive care, of course, it's important to know that it may not be successful. There's certainly no guarantee that an extremely preterm infant would survive if it's given, but it definitely gives a chance. And the other is, we don't know the long-term outcome, whether or not the baby would have some, none, or many uh, issues with their neurodevelopment, for example, or, or other medical conditions. So sometimes it's a really difficult decision, uh, always it is, um, and sometimes parents really have a tough time making a choice. And so this is where I'm showing these last two bullets here. So trial of intensive care 
which kind of means, yes, the parents are not ready to choose palliative comfort care uh, where they know their baby would die in a short period of time uh, while being loved and supported, uh, but they do want to initiate intensive care, but want to revisit the decision after the baby is born and after they see the early hours or days of the baby's life, when one might get a better sense of whether or not there is a chance for survival and what the chances of an, an outcome that the parents can uh, handle and, and are ready to have in their life moving forward. The final option I mentioned there is the default option, meaning sometimes parents and the healthcare practitioners cannot uh, reach a clear decision in time or there is no clear decision between palliative comfort care or intensive care. And the default option means whatever that institute uh, has in place for a baby, let's say born at 25 weeks, what, what will be provided? Will it be intensive care or palliative comfort care if no decision is made? And generally the default options are intensive care as this provides the option later to turn to palliative comfort care if a family so chooses. So given the difficult decision, as you can already see just through those uh, short slide before with some uh, options for management, uh, we've advocated for shared decision making. And there's always at least two parties involved in shared decision making, which of course, uh, when you think of this decision, it would be at a minimum uh, mother uh, who has the extremely preterm infant inside of her uh, and at least one healthcare practitioner. And a big part of the shared decision-making process is determining at the beginning the degree of involvement, meaning how involved does the parent or parents want to be uh, and how much do they want to involve other family members and exactly how much do they want the healthcare practitioner involved in the decision. And so you know, you're equal parties and you're working together to make a decision and there has to be sharing of information and sharing of values. There's two experts in shared decision-making. It is not just the physician and nor is it just the parent. There has to be a combination of this sharing of the important information around the decision and the important values, which I'll get to further in a minute around the decision. And it's clear when there's been shared decision-making, when you have mutual agreement at the end on the decision plan that's going to be implemented. It does not mean that the two people may fully agree on what is the best decision, but it means they do agree on implementing, you know, putting in place, for example, the decision of intensive care or the decision for palliative comfort care for the baby. And why is shared decision-making so good in our opinion for the decision around uh, antenatal decision-making for an extremely preterm infant? Well, it really fits because it's in this category of difficult decision where there's more than one reasonable treatment option or there's uncertainty about the best treatment option. And what then, like, we really don't know. It, we, we don't have a perfect answer for what should be instituted for each and every baby. And the final bit there is that the decision is preference sensitive. And this means that two completely reasonable people who have the same information and they understand it all based upon their preferences in terms of their values, opinions, background, they may choose different choices. And that's why we think shared decision-making is the best choice in this situation. Now, just to give you a little bit of a story of where my work and passion for this came from, it, part of it really started after my final year of training in Melbourne, Australia, where uh, this here is Flinders Street Station and one of the major intersections. And uh, when I was there, I got the chance to learn a lot for some, from some wonderful people. And one thing I noticed was, wow, we really want to always challenge the current evidence and think about what we're doing currently. Don't just keep doing the same thing. You want to contemplate why you're doing what you're doing. And something that I noticed in Australia was that they seem to be quoting different numbers around survival and long-term outcomes for extremely preterm infants compared to what we were uh, using in Ottawa before I had uh, left for my final year of fellowship. So taking you back over 10 years, this is kind of what my mind was struck by when looking at the evidence. So you'll see there's a column uh, for Melbourne and a column for Ottawa. And then the sub columns of looking at survival and neurodevelopmental uh, disability rates. The first thing you'll notice is that at 20, 
two weeks, there really was actually no data in coming from either place and uh, from Melbourne or uh, from Ottawa. And, and we were using neurodevelopmental data uh, from what's called the Epicure study in the United Kingdom. And so that's very different than today, but just to put the background of 10 plus years ago, we didn't have data. Then when I compared the numbers for survival, you can see quite a big difference as what was being used in Ottawa versus Melbourne. And they're not that different. The countries are quite similar, a lot of the same care. I didn't sense there was a big difference. So I was thinking, well, why are we using such different numbers? You'll see, so survival, for example, at 24 weeks was quoted to be approximately 67% in Melbourne, while it was approximately 50% in Ottawa. And then looking also at the neurodevelopmental uh, disability rates, again, if you look at 20, let's choose uh, 25 weeks, in Melbourne, the local uh, data was saying about 25% of survivors would have a neurodevelopmental disability of some significance, while we were quoting 40% from Epicure. So these numbers could influence parents. And I thought, boy, uh, let's make sure we get uh, a review of this data. And, and we did do that. And I'm not going to go into the details of that, but we have uh, collated a bunch of data from around the world and put it together in what's called a meta-analysis uh, to provide uh, clearer data for parents should they be interested in these numbers. Now, the other part of why things could be different somewhere is the attitudes of the healthcare providers. So when I came back to Ottawa, I said, well, let's look at what, what do our local people here in Ottawa, and we, we looked at 130 healthcare providers, what do they think about requests for intensive care or requests for palliative care from parents? And how does that change after they hear about evidence, such as survival rates, neurodisability rates, and contemplations of the ethical difficulties uh, about the decisions that have to be made uh, by these families? And so to walk you through this slide, the first thing you'll see I highlight there is the response options. So this was a survey and they could answer with never, occasionally, quite often, almost always or always. So you see that along the X axis okay, on the bottom. So right here, you know, in all each of these little differences, different uh, charts. The y-axis, which goes from 0 to 100, is the percentage of participants in terms of these 130 people, who, healthcare providers, so physicians, nurses, some medical students, were, the, were these participants? How did they answer? What was their percentage? And then at the top, you'll see there's light gray and a dark gray. And the light gray was what, how people answered before the evidence-based presentation and the presentation that discussed you know, ethical issues. And then how did they answer post presentation, which was the dark gray. So to give an example, let's look here, for example, at 22 weeks. And the first scenario was, if parents request intensive care for their baby, I would resuscitate. So now the person has to, the healthcare provider has to answer one of their five options. And what you see is before the presentation, close to 80% said that they would never uh, provide resuscitation uh, to a baby born in the 22 week gestational age window, even if the parents were requesting it. On the other hand, post presentation, you see that drops by almost 50% to 40%. While after the evidence, you'll see now, instead of really nobody choosing almost always and always, it goes up to above 10% of people would, would always or almost always resuscitate a baby born at 22 weeks if parents uh, requested intensive care. And more or less, if you just take all this data together for 22 weeks, and I'm not showing you 25, but 22, 23, 24, and 25 weeks, all healthcare providers, there was a shift towards more likely to provide intensive care after receiving evidence about survival rates, neurodevelopmental disability rates, and about the ethical issues. Now, what about if parents requested palliative care for the baby? Was it what would healthcare providers do? And this was saying, would they still resuscitate? Meaning parents did not want intensive care, they wanted palliative care, but the healthcare provider would instead still resuscitate. And it's actually the same here in that now healthcare providers were again more likely after the presentation to resuscitate even if parents wanted palliative comfort care. 
And so an example could be looking at 24 weeks before the presentation, 40% of the participants would, would say they would never resuscitate if parents asked for uh, intensive, uh, for palliative comfort care. While it rises, for example, the almost always goes up to almost 20% after they've heard the presentation saying they would uh, actually resuscitate against a parent's wishes. So this showed about what the baseline knowledge and attitude, the attitudes were in our institution. It showed how they could be changed by hearing some evidence. And it also, of course, shows the varied responses. Because as you can see, there's lots of, uh, from never to always in almost every single one of these graphs, there's a variety. And that has to be kept in mind. And it again shows how much there is beyond just specific knowledge uh, that results in different opinions. There's values big time. And so speaking on that is there's socio-familial factors that are involved obviously in decisions and how people think. You know, what is one's family structure? How many children do you have? How many parents are there? Do you have supportive extended family? What's one's religion or faith and their beliefs in God? Uh, what about their cultural or social background? What have they seen through their lives? What are their perspectives? What, what are their values? Do they value quality of life or do they more strongly value life regardless of its quality, uh, shall we say? What about economics? Where do you live? Can you have a baby who may have uh, certain healthcare needs in your community or would you have to move your life? So these are all factors that must be a part of a decision and are brought in when you use shared decision making. So because of our strong advocacy for shared decision making, we also wanted to make sure we had enough tools regarding uh, particularly the information uh, should parents want it. And so we decided to develop a decision aid uh, that would provide standardized information for parents should they want it. And it's always still the process of decision making needs to be individualized and personalized in shared decision making, but we also wanna have accurate and standard information. Because you wouldn't want one doctor to say, oh, well, the chance of survival is this, and another doctor to say, oh, well, the chance of survival is that, when they're both looking at the same information. It may be that we don't know an exact number, and, and one really never does you know a perfect uh, estimate of survivability for um, an individual baby, but we would like to have standard information. And so what we did is we, there's a very specific international collaborative on how to make a good decision aid that is not biased, that provides clear information, that discusses the options. And when we went through the process of making this, uh, we went from a prototype of six cards to actually 24 cards uh, that are available, not always used because some parents don't want them, but they're available for parents uh, should they so choose uh, to have this these as part of their decision-making support. And we did test this out for five month period with uh, about 20 couples um, and uh, family, you know, parents. And it was a very positive uh, change from what we call a baseline decisional conflict, meaning they were unsure of what their decision should be to a post uh, decisional conflict score that was much lower. So you can see here 52 was the decision, the average con decisional conflict that a family I uh, was feeling before the consultation, and it went down to 10. And when it's over 37, it more or less means they don't know, like someone doesn't know what they want to do. They're conflicted. They, they don't know. And when it's under 25, it means they're ready for a decision. So this was not compared to not using a decision aid, but it does show that certainly using a shared decision making approach with the availability of a decision aid as uh, supported parents to make decisions and not feel conflicted. Now it's not just about just the parents or just about the single healthcare practitioner who uh, speaks to the family uh, the most, there is a team. So you now here's one of my uh, youngsters uh, years ago in Australia and you know, getting ready, looks pretty sure of himself, knows what he's gonna do. 
Uh, and then, whoa, life comes along. Wait a minute. Yikes. He is, you can see he's kind of staring. I'm about to jump over a big gap. And I think we could compare this to I'm about to make a really big decision. And sure enough, what do you need? You need some something behind you. You need something on your sides. You need someone in front of you. And that's a decision. And that's when you're making decisions, all of these factors that have come before, that are going to come after, and that are helping you from the on you know, right there on the sides at that moment of the decision, you hope that that will result in a, a best choice for you. And uh, he made it across. He's still alive. It wasn't really that big of a jump for him. So that's, that's good. I, but what I, this speaks to is, you know, what do people think who are all team members? And when we implemented shared decision making with the decision aid available uh, in our institution, about a year later, we interviewed, um, so not a year later, the data, we put it a year later, but it was actually early on in the implementation, we interviewed healthcare providers who had been a part of the decision-making process with families when there was this shared decision-making. And what we found, what facilitated shared decision-making is if people thought that the parents were more prepared and confident because of it. And here's a nurse from the birthing unit who said, we felt like the parents were being heard a little bit more versus being told how it was going to be. Parents feel much more comfortable in their decision-making as well and supported and heard. So that's a definite you know, positive to shared decision-making. Also, here's another one where the, where the idea that facilitates it is if people believe the choice should be the families to make. And here's a neonatologist who said, I think that it is an important idea that families are the ones who are going to live with these choices for forever. And so it should be their choice. Now, of course, there are barriers. And one is where healthcare providers have difficulty knowing when to apply this shared decision-making approach where there really are two equal options. And here they say, I think that the most difficult part is to determine when you feel the options are equally valid. So it's the outside cases and where is this line and how firm do you apply your line? And that's the struggle, this idea of when should one say, well, palliative comfort care isn't an option anymore or intensive care is not an option anymore. And then finally, as one can imagine, just the stress and difficulty of the decision for parents. And this is another birthing unit nurse who said, I feel like it could be very overwhelming for parents if they come in at we'll say 22 or 23 weeks, not even having a thought about a preterm baby because they assume everything's going to be normal with their pregnancy. And so their concern would be that shared decision-making and involving the family could just overwhelm them. But what do parents say? And Katrina Stobe, who is the predecessor from Fabiana, wrote a lovely article with um, a group of parents. Um, and then we, uh, also looked uh, and asked a batch of parents when we were making the Canadian um, Pediatric Society statement about how to support uh, parents in this decision. We found out and we asked them, like, what do you want? And this is not a fully comprehensive list. And again, there's individualization, but we learned parents want different involvement in the decision. They want balanced and accurate information. And really important, words matter. They want good communication. Trust needs to be developed. They want to hear about the positives of prematurity. It's not all bad by any means, uh, and that needs to be come across. And they want realistic hope. And then, of course, the acceptance of the gray that we don't know. And so that's where my advocacy comes from. And uh, I'd love to answer any questions. And I uh, thank you to these specific colleagues who have worked uh, through uh, this shared decision making um, implementation with me. And of course, to the many parents and families who have been a part of uh, part of the discussions. All right, Dr. Moore, thank you so much for your presentation, for the work that you've been doing. I, When I met you, I said this is such an important work for families to be involved and make informed decisions because yeah. this is a conversation that we as parents will never forget. Right. Despite the outcome, we remember that conversation and mm -hmm. it's always hard. And I always think about, obviously, for, from the doctor's side as well, how hard it must be to sit down and break the news to parents. And I really appreciate all the work that you've done. And I always think about, we don't see the world as it is. We see the world through our eyes and our experiences and our values and culture, all the things that you shared. 
And I think that's why the shared decision is so important because you're taking families' values into consideration because you, I believe, as a physician, also come with your own set of beliefs that sometimes how do we try not to influence parents' decision, but it's, it's a share uh, conversation. And I think it is, is very important. Yeah, but we don't really have... a, a sharing of both people's values can be needed at times, like you just said, because we do all have values. And so it's, it's information and, and value sharing from both sides. Absolutely. Uh, so we don't have a lot of time for questions, but there's some things that I really wanted to share with us. So maybe other units who are, that are not using this tool, they could use this tool. How does it work in your unit with parents? Yes, so uh, as people would know who are in this area, of course, the parent's first contact is always with the obstetrical team, uh, be it a high risk obstetrical team. Uh, and what happens at that point is that does start the process right away of the shared decision, whatever is stated by any healthcare provider or people who are interacting with them. So how it works for us is you know, the obstetrical team will call our neonatal team to come and we will always come providing the decision aid if families want it for them to look at it to, it's offered to use during the decision making process we would have for example anywhere from 30 to 90 minute consultation as the neonatology team uh, and speaking with the family to address their questions their concerns express what the options are in their specific case uh, and then we really try to always convene as a whole team which is not easy meaning obstetrical and neonatal to firm up a complete plan that involves the care for the mom and the care for the baby after he or she uh, is born. Um, I'm not sure, I hope that answers it and I'm happy to try and add more if you'd like. So the cards that you mentioned and the parents handouts, so they are available obviously for your hospitals, but can people across Canada or even other countries, English uh, language can use it? Yes, yeah, for sure. So we have our own little repository website it's nothing fancy but it is open access and and widely available and it's a link uh, i think you could share uh, that people can download the decision cards uh, and also there's parent handbooks as you've uh, mentioned that have similar information but it's you know, worded a bit differently it's an actual handbook rather than these cards that the physician has and yes certainly i've been asked from holland uh, finland various spots in the states, uh, other spots across Canada for these cards and, and places adapt them slightly to each and uh, their own units for the differences that may exist in those places. That is good. We are making the link available on the comments below our okay. uh, Facebook. Great. So my next question is, is your work reflected on the recommendation of the Canadian Pediatric Society? Yes, so uh, Dr. Bridget Lemire, my colleague and I uh, co-authored that statement along with the fetus and newborn committee. And we had done our work in Ottawa, uh, which of course involved looking at international work by others. And so yes, we, we took what we had done, which involved looking internationally at data and evidence. Uh, and we put that together into the recommendations which are part of uh, the fetus and newborn committees statement, which is found at the Canadian uh, Pediatric Society website. They're open to anybody. All right. Thank you so much. Dr. Gregory, there's some uh, questions coming from the Facebook Live, but we, we really don't have time right now. Uh, I was wondering if I could send them to you and you could sure. reply. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you. I really appreciate your time today and all your information. And uh, the links are at the bottom of this uh, screen so you can access all his tools and also the Canadian Pediatric Society recommendations. So thank you, Dr. Moore. Thank you. And uh, I, mean, I, I can close with a line if you'd like. Uh, I do have a quote uh, that I just wanted to show and, and just to finish with, uh, if that's okay. Absolutely. And. It's shown here, and this is a quote from a family. And it says here, but you know, I've titled it the positive in a difficult situation. So these, this family said, your information session, which was the consultation with us was very helpful and helped us understand the situation and make an educated decision. I would be happy to recommend such a consultation to anyone with similar issues. Thank you. And that family actually chose uh, palliative comfort care for their baby and the baby did pass away in the hours after birth. And 
to me, this brings up the whole key point, which is that uh, I certainly desire that all parents uh, feel a sense of an appreciation for like, really great efforts that their healthcare providers make and the compassion that the healthcare pro care provider gives, regardless of the exact decision or the outcome that comes from that decision. We, we clearly can't always know how things are going to go. And we're not always all going to have a perfect agreement on a decision, but I would hope that the parents, based on how the healthcare providers act and communicate, will feel wonderfully supported and, uh, and positive. That's wonderful. And communication is always the key word. How do we communicate with parents in such a uh, difficult time in their lives? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So thank you very much. And thank you everyone for watching us at home today. Uh, we are doing Facebook Live every Monday and Friday, 1 p.m. Eastern time. You can send your suggestions. What topics would you like us to address? And uh, just a reminder that every Wednesday, 1 p.m. Eastern time, uh, time Kate Robson, who is a therapist, is hosting a real-time peer support group here on Facebook for parents. And to access her groups, you can go to Canadian uh, Premier Parent Support Network, which is our private Facebook group. And also we have the COVID care program, which is a two-session therapy for families uh, who are dealing with an ICU at this time or the first year home. You can get more information on our website, which is Canadian Premier's dot org as well as all the past uh, facebook live sessions are recorded and available there thank you and i see you next time